Good morning and welcome back to Union Church of Los Angeles, Sunday morning English language service. We're happy you joined us here in the sanctuary and out on Zoom. Those of you on Zoom, please mute your devices at this time. Thank you. For our prelude, Jin and I will be performing for you Yezu, Joy of Man's Desiring by Johann Sebastian Bach. Good morning and welcome to Union Church of Los Angeles. So good to see uh, so many of you with us this morning. And in person, we have some folks that are joining us on Zoom. We want to welcome the Zoom worshipers with us as well. This is a wonderful opportunity this Sunday for us to center our attention on the one who gives life, the one who gives hope, the one who is the center of our peace. This morning, I want to invite us to the call to worship by reading a passage out of Psalm chapter 63, verse 1 through 5. In it, King David says this, O oh God, you are my God. Early I will seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you in a dry and thirsty land with no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary. You see, to, to see your power and your glory, because your loving kindness is better than life. 
My lips will praise you. Thus will I bless you while I lived. I lift up my hands in your name. My soul will be satisfied with the morrow and the fatness, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. King David says, I will seek you early in the morning, and my lips will praise you in the sanctuary. I want to invite you to stand at this time if you are able to, and join me in a word of prayer as we begin, as we prepare our hearts for worship. Let us go before the Lord in prayer. Good and gracious God, we thank you, God, that we can come together this early morning on this Sunday. Lord, we thank you that today is the Lord's day. Today is a day in which we pause, God, and center our attention on you, the author and perfecter of our faith. God, we thank you for the worship, the sermon, God, the announcements, all the aspects of the service, God, that will point us to this new reality that you have for us, God, this beloved community. God, we thank you for the the saints that gather together because we know that where two or three gather in your name, there you are. Lord, we know that in the, abun in the abundance of praise, your presence moves. So God, we, pr we ask that you re receive our offering and receive our gifts of worship this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'm gonna invite the worship team to lead us as we sing these songs before the Lord this morning. Thank you, Pastor Reuben. Please remain standing as Lily and I lead you in the opening hymn, I Gave My Life for Thee. I gave my life for thee, my precious blood I shed. That thou might ransom to be and quicken from the dead. I gave, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given for me? I gave, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given for me? My father's house of For earthly light, for wandering sad and lone, I left, I left it all for thee, hast thou left aught for me? I left, I left it all for thee, hast thou left aught for me? I suffered much for thee more than my tongue can tell of bitterest agony to rescue thee from hell i born i born it all for thee what hast thou born for me i born i born it all for thee what hast thou born for me and i have brought to Salvation full and free, my pardon and my love. I bring, I bring rich gifts to thee, what hast thou brought to me? I bring, I bring rich gifts to thee, what hast thou brought to me? Amen. Please remain standing as Jubilee leads us. In our song of praise, they'll know we are Christians. We are one in the spirit. Sing with us this morning. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that our unity will one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know. Bye, I love. Bye, I love. Bye, I love. Bye, I love. 
each other we will walk hand in hand we will walk with each other we will walk hand in hand and together we'll spread the news that god is in our land the know we are christians by our love by our love yes they'll know we are christians by our love This morning, our community prayer comes from a really fascinating uh, saint in the church. His name is Black Elk. He was a Lakota chief. There's a long history of uh, the Battle of Custard and the aftermath of what happened um, with the institution of reservations in our country. We are in a Native American Indigenous Peoples History Month, and part of what we try to do is have prayers that reflect the different a mosaic of Christians that are a part of our global community. And this prayer comes from Black Elk, who was one of the last Lakota chiefs. He became a Christian, and he wrote a book, uh, Black Elk Speaks, in which he talks about his journey of going from uh, this very, very personal journey of making Jesus Christ his Lord and Savior and what it meant for him to be a community leader. And he brings this prayer that really centers uh, a lot of Lakota values which are rooted in the care for creation. So let us read this in unison. It says this, The garden is rich with diversity, with plants of a hundred families, in the space between the trees, with all the colors and fragrances, basil, mint, and lavender. Great mystery, keep my remembrance pure. Raspberry, apple, rose. Great mystery, fill my heart with love. Dill, anise, tansy. Holy winds blow in me. Rotoron, zindia. May my prayer be beautiful. May my remembrance, O oh great mystery, be as incense to thee in the sacred grove of eternity, as I smell and remember the ancient forests of earth. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Reuben. Please stand if you are able for our hymn, Give of Your Best to the Master. Give of your best to the master, give of the strength of your youth, throw your 
whistles fresh blowing harder into the battle for truth. Jesus has set the example, dauntless was he young and brave. Give him your loyal devotion, give him the best that you strength of your youth, clad in salvation's full armor, join in the battle for truth. Give of your best to the master, give him first place in your heart, give him first place in your service, consecrate every part. And to you shall be given God his beloved son gave Gratefully seeking to serve him Give him the best that you have Give of your best to the master Give him the strength of your youth Clad in salvation's full armor Give of your best to the master, not else is worthy his love. He gave himself for your ransom, give him his glory above. Lay down his life without murmur, you from the sin to do Give him your heart's adoration, give him the best that you have. Give of your best to the master, give him the strength of your youth. Clad in salvation's full armor, join in the battle for truth. We're going to pass the peace in a few moments, but before we pass the peace, uh, which is an opportunity for us to get out of our pews and greet uh, one another in the peace of Christ, this, uh, this weekend is Veterans Weekend. Uh, this weekend also marked a, a moment of memorial for a very longtime church member, uh, our dear brother Jim Furuya. Some of you may know Jim Furuya or knew of his impact not only at Union Church but in Little Tokyo. Um, I w had the opportunity and the privilege of uh, being at the memorial with several Union Church members. And uh, during the biography, there were portions that were read that just impacted me so much. And I thought about bringing that towards, towards our moment of passing the peace. And I just want to spend briefly a moment reading a, a short excerpt from his uh, biography. It says this, James Toshiyuki Furuya was born at home with the assistance of a Japanese midwife in San Francisco on February 6, 1929. He was the eldest of two, two children born to Kunihara and Ishigeko Furuya. His sister Helen followed 19 months later. Jim and his sister were latchkey kids as their parents managed the family's wholesale florist business. Jim's unsupervised childhood started off with high drama. He was run over by a car not once but twice he attended the local elementary school and Japanese school at the end of each school day. Kendo, fishing, the Cub Scouts took up the remaining time of his very busy schedule. Goes on to talk about how World War II and the bombing of Pearl Harbor greatly disrupted their family. Um, Jim returned to Japan where his uh, aunt cared for him. But it says this, he returned to the United States after the, the World War II, as there were much more economic opportunities in the United States, it says this, the second half of 1958 was filled with life-changing events for Jim. He began attending Union Church in Little Tokyo at the invitation of Reverend Toriyuma, who had become the pastor. Jim then met his wife, Alice Matsusaka, through a mutual friend. They were married by Reverend Toriyuma. He goes on to become an engineer and uh, works at Lytton 
And in his engineering uh, career, he ends up being the first on the, on the first flight to go from North Pole to South Pole. It says this, he was aboard the first airline to circumnavigate the Earth over North and South Poles in 1965. The historic flight was in a Boeing 707 dubbed the Polecat, and Jim's role was to troubleshoot the plane's navigational equipment. The flight covered 26,000 miles in 62 hours and 27 minutes and, and set eight world aviation speed records. Uh, a lot more can be said about his life, but he passed away in October, but was faithfully attending our church through Zoom. Uh, and so I just wanted to acknowledge the lifelong impartation, decades of serving as moderator at the Presbytery, serving on sessions, serving in various other capacities. So as we pass the peace today, I want to simply invite us to just remember how beautiful it is that God is weaving us together in this beautiful community. God has located us here in Little Tokyo, a place that has such a, such a special place in the city of Los Angeles. So I invite you to stand at this moment and read these words of peace together. If you're able to stand, uh, join me um, as we say these words together. Christ, Christ is, is our, our peace. peace. Not, not an, an easy, easy peace, peace, not an insignificant peace, peace not a half-hearted peace. peace. But may, may the, the peace, peace of our Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ be with, with us now. now. The peace, peace of the Lord be with you and also with you. Please feel free to get out of your seats and greet somebody in the name of Jesus Christ. Always a great sound in the church when everybody, everybody's hustling and bustling about. It's a sacred sound. Uh, this morning, our scripture reading comes from our brother Bob Bates, and we are very privileged to have our very own Pastor Randy Choi bringing the word. Uh, we want to invite our brother Bob, if he would unmute himself, and lead us in this reading from Genesis chapter 47, verses 20 through 28. Thank you. So Joseph bought all of the land in Egypt for the Pharaoh. The Egyptians, one and all, sold their fields because the famine was too severe for them. The land became Pharaoh's. And Joseph reduced the people to servitude from one end of Egypt to the other. However, he did not buy the land of the priests because they received a regular allotment from the Pharaoh, had food enough for the allotment. Pharaoh gave them. That is why they did not sell their land. Joseph said to the people, now that I have bought you and your land today for the Pharaoh, here is seed for you so that you can plant the ground. But when the crop comes up, comes in, give a fifth of it to the Pharaoh. The other four fifths you may keep as the seeds of the field and as the food for yourselves and your household and your children. You have saved our lives, they said. May we find favor in the eyes of our Lord. We will be in bondage to Pharaoh. So Joseph established it as a law concerning the land in Egypt, still in force today that a fifth of the produce belongs to Pharaoh. It was only the land of the priests that did not become Pharaoh's. 
Now the Israelites settled in Egypt in the region of Goshen. They acquired property there and were fruitful and increased greatly in number. Jacob lived in Egypt 17 years and the years of his life were 147. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Randy Choi. I'm one of the uh, teaching pastors here. Uh, I haven't met some of you guys. I'm not used to uh, feedback. Sorry. Um, hey, we are... We're in our series of Joseph. I think uh, Pastor Uno will be wrapping up the series next week, and then we'll uh, be moving on to some other topics. Uh, but today, um, I wanted to talk about integrity, all right? So integrity, according to the, uh, the dictionary, is defined as uh, a quality of being honest and having strong moral principles, moral uprightness, the state of being whole and undivided. Um, you know, when it comes to uh, believers, Christians in a church, um, sometimes I feel like um, integrity, work, effort, there is this um, kind of this prejudice against talking about this, uh, about those particular topics. I don't know if it's just me, uh, but if there is kind of a, a bias and a prejudice to avoid topics of like uh, diligence, integrity, character, hard work, etc. within the church, um, if there is a bias or prejudice, I'm pretty sure the bias and prejudice is because why? It's about God's grace, right? Believers, we focus on grace and grace alone as a source of our salvation. I've preached probably, I can't even count how many messages on God's grace, uh, about God's grace. Um, but I think the, if there is friction about talking about integrity, character, and work within the Christian context, I think it's an unnecessary friction. I really think they complement each other. Um, I recently, um, I was Facebook stalking some pastor friends of mine, and um, I don't know if it's just me, but I really feel like, except for me, Ruben, and Unho, and Keith, like a lot of pastors are weird, man. They're just strange, man. So there was this, you guys are laughing kind of loud. <laughs> there was this debate. Um, a friend of mine posted, he's a pastor, and he's like, hey, great sermon today. Not my sermon, but the church he's, he, he attends. He said, great sermon today, you know, focused on uh, hard work, diligence, planning, and just keep the grind up, right? Keep working, keep grinding. And all these other pastors, man, it was like a feeding frenzy. They were like, um, I hope the gospel was mentioned you know, I hope God's grace was mentioned, like basically critiquing his post, right? Like apart from the gospel, all those things are like, uh, uh, they should not be mentioned on, a, on, on the pulpit on a Sunday. And they were just going at it, right? Like just critiquing him saying it should be God's grace, God's grace, etc. right? And um, like I said, man, just annoying, right? Annoying. Um, and then he, he tried to defend himself, and he was like, it wasn't even his sermon. It was a guest speaker, right? But they were just critiquing him and saying, like, you know, hard effort has no, no place in God's grace, right? Um, and then towards the end, uh, there were, like, some other guys were like, hey, who preached, this ser uh, who preached this sermon? And it was, like, a really well-known professor at a local seminary, and they all they all didn't say anything after that after they find out who preached it they're all keyboard gangsters all right once they found out who preached the sermon they were all quiet right um again you know i think pastors and people who preach the gospel um, i would even disagree with some of the uh, uh, cr uh critics in that post right like i really feel like the more we understand god's grace it impacts what our action, right? If we really like profoundly, like, you know, I was lost, I was uh, wounded, I was just so, so hurt, and like I felt alone and isolated, and then God's love touched my heart, right? God surrounded with me, sur surrounded me with this community that loved on me unconditionally. You know, his love has transformed me, and hence, I'm not gonna take this second chance of life for granted. Right? 
I'm gonna, I'm gonna make the most out of every day. I'm gonna give my all to every day. So it's like, I, I almost feel like there's this unnecessary dichotomy between grace and character, integrity. In my opinion, like, imagine just the coin, right? It's, it's two sides of what? The same coin, right? The more we experience God's grace and love, the more we've been touched by his unconditional acceptance and we feel glimpses of that within a, a Christian community, the more it deeply impacts our actions, right? The way we carry ourselves, including work, including just our daily functional character, our, our integrity in our lives. Um, today's passage, we find Joseph um, in this management position. And um, before I continue, I want to just, uh, again, uh, give credit. As a good seminarian, I want to give credit to the source of a lot of this content. Uh, Pastor Charles Swindoll, we're, we're influenced by his book in this particular sermon series. Um, and, you know, pa Pastor Swindoll says, like, in the Christian, uh, on, the, on a, a lot of Christian pulpits, there's not enough conversation about work, right? Like, I'm a bivocational pastor. I work, I have a nine to five. And, like, he really says, like, there's probably not enough messages and conversation about work, character, integrity. And I would agree, you know, like, vast majority of us, most of our lives are spent where? Usually at work, right? So he, he feels like there should be more conversation. I would agree. Um, and before I, uh, I continue, I do want to provide, like, a disclaimer. I think... Um, you know, there's a lot of people probably in, the, in, in these pews and even on Zoom and even friends and families that we know that right now that struggle with unemployment, um, also struggle with uh, underemployment. You guys know what underemployment is, right? Or just struggle in very difficult, toxic work environments. Um, so I definitely want to take time to acknowledge that. Uh, unfortunately, I've experienced probably all those things in various degrees myself, and I understand like the pain and the difficulty of being in those situations. There's no formulaic answer, of course, right, to, to come out of those situations. Sometimes it is a process, but I just want to encourage those of us who are in unemployment, underemployment, or just very toxic, difficult work situations that, you know, God sees you, Right? He sees you, your pain, your difficulty is not unseen by our Heavenly Father, and that the Holy Spirit gives us strength, right? gives us strength to endure. Uh, but continuing on with this theme of character and integrity, um, you know, the first reason um, I think why we should talk about work, our character integrity at work, is uh, work, work scenarios, work situations offer a revealing display of our character, right? Like who you are, who I am on Sunday, is that really who you are, right? <laughs> right? Who we are on Monday morning is probably <laughs> more of an accurate depiction of who we are, right? Work displays, and it's not about Christian guilt or religious shame, it's just honesty, right? Like if, if I am a negative, pessimistic, chronic complainer, and I just have these uh, unhealthy kind of behavioral patterns inside of me, right? Work is a great opportunity for these things to what? Come to the surface, right? Work, work situations dis reveal a dis uh, our revealing display of our character. Even the coworkers that we have, people that we work with, they probably see us in a more holistic manner, right? In a more transparent manner than what? People on Sunday, on Sunday morning, right? So there's a question that we ask ourselves, like, like imagine your coworkers right now. What would they say about you? My coworkers love me, right? <laughs> they love me. Um, Ask yourself, what would the coworkers say about so say about us, right? And again, this is not a, this is not about guilt and shame, but I think it's it's a, a understanding of who we are in a transparent and honest light, right? Our actions and attitude on the job display our character. Any negative traits, right, like sloth, deception, dishonesty, anger, greed, discord, gossip, pettiness. Right? All this stuff is surfaced usually Monday through Friday between 9 and 5, right? rather than Sunday. But not, also the, not only the bad things, but the positive things as well. Right? 
ambition, punctuality, honesty, good sense of humor, right? Efficiency, effectiveness, enthusiasm, willingness, all these things are usually, again, displayed Monday through Friday from 9 to 5. When we go back to the protagonist of our story, um, one thing we learn about Joseph, or the first thing we learn about Joseph that we want to hone in on today, is that Joseph, in my assessment, Joseph did not take anything for granted. Right? Joseph took nothing for granted. Joseph efficiently, like Joseph was in a very difficult situation. If, if you under the, understand the wider context of this particular passage we read today, um, like we, in scripture, Joseph's boss, which is Pharaoh, is mentioned at a glance, right? Just mentioned at a glance. But this is the part of theology I really appreciate where we use our imagination. Like, do you know any powerful people? Like, really, really powerful. What are they usually like? They have high expectations, <laughs> very little patience, no time for excuses, and they want what? Results, right? Joseph, his boss was what? Pharaoh. Joseph had a very demanding supervisor, very demanding boss, right? And not only that, but Joseph had um, people he, he cared about deeply. That was what? His family, right? His family was in deep need, desperate need. They needed housing. They needed food. There was a lot of demand, right? And then he had this whole other group of people, Egyptians, who were vying for what? Resources, right? So there were so many moving parts in Joseph's um, in Joseph's particular job situation. And like uh, scholars and historians say, Joseph's family was not like, my family is like three people, right? You know how many people Joseph had in his family? 70, <laughs> 70 people, like, you know, like if I had 70 people who depended on me for resources, I'm just not answering the door, right? It's like, <laughs> I'm turning off all the lights, and I'm not answering the door, right? Joseph had so many moving parts, but if you read the narrative of Joseph, Joseph did not take anything for granted, right? If you know the, uh, uh, the movement of Joseph's story, Joseph, Pharaoh depended on Joseph, what? For revelation of dreams, for preparation of the famine, right? Joseph, Joseph could have, I think, easily went up to Pharaoh and said, hey man, you would have never have had this dream interpreted if it wasn't for me. You owe me, bro, <laughs> right? Or you wouldn't even known about the famine if it wasn't for me. You owe me, bro, right? No, Joseph said, did not take anything for granted, right? He said, I need to appease this guy. I need to make this guy happy, because if he's not happy with me, he could what, right? Get rid of me in a heartbeat. I need to be mindful of him. I need to be mindful of the 70 family members that are literally depending on me for their life, right? And all these Egyptians, because we only have so many resources, and all these Egyptians who also are keeping their eyes very close on the limited resources that we have. Again, so many moving parts, but the point being is this first point is Joseph did not take anything for granted, right? He calculated all the nuances of his constituencies, right, in his operating. There was not this like uh, kind of entitled, blind, like, oh, God will take care of it. We just gotta, we just gotta keep moving forward. No, he paid attention. Right? He paid attention to the personalities, the, the consequences, and all these moving parts with character and integrity. Right? It ain't easy. This Christian life is not easy. I, I told my wife I was going to embarrass her, so I gave her a precursor. Right? <laughs> uh, like my wife and I, we, we pride ourselves on being very hard workers. Right. Um, She's probably a little harder working than me. Like if the waves are good, you know, I might, I might get sick. You know, you know. What I'm <laughs> uh, my wife, she works in a very, uh, very difficult field too, right? And then uh, a while back, she she got a promotion. Um, she was a lowly associate. Right? <laughs> now she's a medium powered counselor. Right? So she got this, she got this pr promotion at her firm, uh, but. The, the managing partner, right? The managing partner at her firm wrote this uh, corporate-wide email uh, announcing the promotion. And you know what he said? 
he said, I uh, want to congratulate, towards the end of the email, I want to congratulate Alex for being a good attorney and a good person, right? That last part is what? Unnecessary. We all, we all if you've been in corporate America, they don't. <laughs> that last part of the sentence is unnecessary, right? But he included it, why? Work is so stressful, right? There's so many moving parts. You got to deal with different personalities, right? Try doing that while being what? A good person, right? It's challenging. It's challenging. It's difficult, but we do it every day. Believers are called to do it every day, and not only uh, by our own power, right? By whose power? Spirit of God, right? Spirit of God. And like, People know, like people in her work, people in my work, they know we're believers, right? So it's like, you can't be being a Christian and cussing people out every day, right? Not taking things for granted. The second point, right? The second point is Joseph never took anything for granted, right? And then the second point is, um, I kind of already talked about it, but a job is a demanding arena of pressure, right? Like, have you guys ever heard of the quote, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth? Who said that? <laughs> the sage, Mike Tyson. <laughs> we, read about, we read about patience, uh, self-control, kindness, gentleness, right? And it's like, oh, Pastor Ruben preached such a good sermon, man. Yeah, yeah, I'm feeling it, right? And then you go to work, <laughs> and then you get that email, or you have that customer or that client or that vendor or that you know we get punched in the mouth and we're like what i could strangle <laughs> this person right? work the pressures of work test again test our character how do we know how do we know god has taken root in my life how do we know the fruits of the spirit are a valid real thing in my life in pressure-filled environments and the best example of that is work. There's so many things in the average job that we have to contend with. Personalities, gossip, and as a believer, some of the stories that go around in the water cooler, like, God, you know, like it gets pretty gnarly and raunchy, right? Like, do I participate in these stories? Do I not? There's this discernment involved, right? Our Christian character is uh, tested, right? Tested at work. Uh, when it comes to character on the job, we can learn some valuable lessons from Joseph. From Joseph. Again, um, he dealt with it, right? He dealt with difficult bosses. He, he dealt with, you know how long the famine lasted? Seven years, right? Seven years this famine, famine last, lasted. And um, before Joseph was placed in this position of power and authority, he was what? Groomed. Groomed and trained by the Spirit of God, right? And now... All of that preparation, right? You're training for the fight. Now it's fight time, right? There's consequences. There's people counting on you. There's expectations. Can you deliver, right? Can you deliver? And Joseph proved to be what? He got punched in the mouth, and what did he do? He kept on moving, right? Kept on moving forward. Us too, rather than blaming employers, uh, blaming clients, industry, society, you know, Use opportunities of pressure, getting punched in the mouth, so to speak, to ob objectively, objectively observe the condition of our faith and our trust in God, right? And the workplace is a great arena for that. Uh, the last point I want to make, and this is my favorite point, um, work, work environments is an exacting test of our efficiency. Right, an exacting test of our efficiency um, and also creativity, right? Efficiency and creativity right, can be sharpened in work environments. Uh, questions like, are, you, are we well organized, right? Are we decisive? Can we make tough decisions? Can we think creative, uh, creatively? Do we meet our deadlines? Do we maintain our budgets, et cetera? Do we accomplish our, goal, our goals, right? I know a lot of people in the nonprofit world, they have great mission statements, great, eloquent, like some of the most uh, meaningful and relevant causes that I've ever encountered. But they cannot follow up with the email to save 
their life, <laughs> right? Like it's not just about having a good mission and a good cause. It's like, hey, are, are, am I efficient? Do I follow? Do I follow through? Right? Can I can I work within these particular parameters? The work is a great place, right, for us to uh, hone and, and kind of refine these skills. Are we accountable, etc.? This is a good time to ask a theological question: Is God sovereign over all aspects of our life? Right? Our faithfulness, our 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 character, our integrity, our work, these are our, all relevant questions when, when it comes to examining our faith. And we get back to Joseph. Um, Joseph had character. We already talked about it. He had integrity. He took nothing, nothing for granted, right? He had character. He had, he had uh, integrity. He refused to, to compromise. He submitted to authority, right? He was loyal, right? He arranged for all of these, all of these constituencies, he had to he had to worry about. Um, but the final component that we learn from Joseph is uh, he was innovative, right? In his workplace, he was innovative. He accepted, like, just imagine for a second, you have a seven-year famine, right? Seven-year famine. You have a very, very demanding, high expectation boss. You have. Uh, people who are essentially depending on you for their livelihood, you have all these other people, like how do you navigate that, right? Innovation, right? Innovation, and that's the last thing that I wanna highlight is like, um, Joseph was in this time of tremendous, tremendous lacking. There was not a lot of resources. Um, people were literally dying. Right? And they, they were looking at Joseph, what should we do? And you know what he did? He stored up famine. I mean, he stored up grain for the famine, right? But who's Pharaoh? Most likely Pharaoh was what? Businessman, right? So if Joseph was like, hey, let's just give this grain out, man. Let's Come on, Pharaoh, don't you want to do good? Pharaoh's going to be like, what? Oh, heck no, <laughs> right? This is my empire, right? So Joseph had to create what? Win-win situation. Where he could help the people, but what? Man, he, he had to answer to Pharaoh. Sorry. So Joseph became uh, creative, right? What Joseph did was um, first he took their money, right? He goes, I'm gonna, you guys got to pay for this grain, gave them the grain, right? But how long did the famine last? Seven years, right? So they came back, said, hey, we gave you all our money, we're still hungry. So Joseph got creative, he got innovative, and he said, all right, you guys are gonna have to start working. Right, working the fields, and then also seven years is a long time. Right, he said, um, "Sell me your land, right?" Because he's going to give away the grain, but he has to report to Pharaoh. So he says, "Sell me your land, and then I'll give you the seed." And so, what historians and scholars suggest is like, um, before the famine, most of the people lived in these pocket areas right for various reasons like it's kind of like everybody lived in la miami chicago right and what joseph did was like all right sell me that land so i could take it back to pharaoh and i could appease my boss right but what i'm gonna do is after i i i get all this land and i tell pharaoh hey we're good it's a win-win thing i'm gonna spread you guys out right i'm gonna spread you out and the bible says he spread them out from border to border right so he took all the land to appease Pharaoh, and then he gave him, he said, you guys go all out throughout Egypt, take this seed, and then you guys are gonna be what? Self-sustaining, right? Take this seed, grow, grow food for yourself, and the only thing I ask you to do is give a fifth back to Pharaoh, right? Again, he didn't take anything for granted, right? It was a real life practical situation, but again, this last point is that God inspired innovation, right? In a very, very difficult, trying time, God inspired innovation. And the people say what? The people say, you, man, I don't, I'm not happy about giving Pharaoh a fifth of, the, fifth of the work that I do, but you saved my life, right? You saved my life. Joseph responded in difficult situations with integrity, character, never took anything for granted, and innovation, right? 
every major breakthrough, right, comes from hard work, character, development, integrity, and creativity, right? Uno, can we get the, uh, the slide? We want to close, guys, again. Remember, like, God's grace and character, integrity, work ethic, like discipleship, they're not, they're not mutually exclusive to topics, right? They're same sides, they're different sides of the same coin. I want to close with the fun part, right? The innovation part, right? We already know about the character integrity part. I want to close with the fun part, which is innovation. Uh, Pastor Swindoll has 35 plus years, 35 plus years of ministry experience. And, um, you know, in his time, he says uh, there's been a lot of joy killers in his ministry experience. And, and as a result, he has come up with joy killing phrases, right? Uh, these joy-killing phrases arise out of fear, uh, fear to risk. We live our, our lives frightened, play it safe, running, scared of being misunderstood, right? And um, I want to just give, you, give us a little bit of insight into these joy-killing phrases, all right? The first one is, so in meetings, all right, if you hear this, then you know in your mind, oh, that's a joy-killer. <laughs> that's a joy-killer right there, right? Uh, the first one is it won't work. We haven't, we haven't the time. Uh, we don't have the personnel to pull it off. It's not in the budget. We're going to get too much criticism. The board isn't going to buy it. We've tried that before. We've never done that before. We're not ready for it yet. Uh, we'll, we'll, we've lost a high, high donors if we do that. All right in theory, but you can't put that into practice. Uh, this could result in a lawsuit. <laughs> That's what my wife says all the time, right? This could result, she's a joy killer, right? It's too modern. It's too old fashioned. So, uh, so and so tried that and failed. We're too small for that. We're too big for that. It costs too much. People won't accept it, right? You guys get the point, right? And I know some of these things, like, you know, sometimes they could get ridiculous. Some of, like, if you, if you have dreamers, you know, you have family and friends who are dreamers, right? Like, sometimes these dreams can get extreme and ridiculous. I get that. And we're not talking about uh, dreams built on faulty foundations. We've already talked and exhaust about character, integrity, follow through, uh, working within our means, etc. right? But with that said, God is a God of what? Innovation, right? Innovation, creativity, right? He, has, he takes five loaves and he feeds what? 5,000. So let's be mindful of that as we work in our daily jobs, as we do our best in the ministry here at Union Church, right? To be mindful. Are these words really quick to come out of my mouth? And if so, man, repent. Repent of that lack of divine imagination in our, in our daily doings, thinkings, right? As Joseph did, right? Joseph did his character, his integrity, and his dreaming literally saved people's lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much uh, for this uh, story of this individual who uh, came from such simple beginnings, uh, but you used him. You used him uh, to be uh, a model, uh, kind of like a lighthouse uh, of what you can do through an individual who is yielding, consistently yielding to your spirit, trusting in your spirit. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Randy. As Jin plays our interlude, please take a moment in uh, silent reflection on the message that Pastor Randy brought to us today.
Thank you, Dan and Jen, for that beautiful uh, rendition. And thank you very much to Pastor Randy. Let's give it up for Pastor Randy. A lot of really good nuggets that I'm sure we'll be chewing on uh, throughout the rest of the day. The one that really struck home to me is who we are on Monday is often more accurate <laughs> than who we are on Sunday. That was very powerful. There's a wonderful movement in the body of Christ uh, called the Moral Monday Movement, uh, headed up by Reverend Dr. William Barber. It was started by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, and it was basically that premise that whatever doesn't translate into Monday's weekly rhythms is really the difference between what our faith and what our action um, is calling us to do. So really, really great word. I'm, I'm sure we will all be meditating on, on this wonderful passage that was brought to us and the word of encouragement. At this time, we're going to be receiving our gifts before the Lord. We want to invite you guys to be generous as much as you are able to, getting involved in all the different ways that we can get involved. We have a few ways to give. If you're able to uh, give online, there's a link through our website. You can go on unionchurchla.org and give uh, online. If you are wanting to write a check or give in person, we have offering um, envelopes in the pews. We want to invite our, our ushers to come forth, and we will be receiving our offering. Join me in a word of prayer as we give thanks to God for all the abundance that he gives towards us. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for these gifts. Lord, we thank you for all the ways in which you are providing. Lord, you are shaping us not only through our spiritual community, God, but through our lives in the marketplace as well. Lord, we bring these gifts because, God, we trust that you are our provider. Bless the giver. Lord, bless all those who are uh, looking for uh, fresh opportunities in their workplace, God, at school. Lord, bless the things that come into our spheres, God, our, and then that we put our hands to. May it be blessings to those around us in Jesus' name. Amen. Ushers, you can go forward. stand to your feet and join us as we sing our doxology and we bring our gifts before God this morning. seated. We have a few announcements that we want to just put before you, uh, let you know what's going on in the life of the church. And again, these announcements are personal invitations. If you, I want to start off by saying, if you don't get our Union Church newsletter, you're missing out. The newsletter is the way to go. If you guys haven't signed up for the newsletter, you can go online or you can email Union Church of Los Angeles. There's a lot of wonderful information there. It feels like there's so much happening that sometimes we might not announce in the Sunday service, but sign up for the newsletter. It goes out every Thursday night or Friday? Friday morning. It goes out every Friday morning. I look forward to it in my inbox every Friday. Just let you guys know we have an 8 o'clock Saturday prayer meeting. If you guys haven't been a part of it, tr check it out. It's very, very simple. It's about 30 minutes long. We have a good core of people every a Saturday, they get together on Zoom, and any prayer requests that come through the website or things that happen in the life of the church, we take some moments to acknowledge them and pray together. It's a wonderful, wonderful time. Nine o'clock, Pastor Ken Yabuki has a Bible study. Pastor Ken Yabuki has been serving as a pastor at church, uh, Union Church for many, many years. He's a marriage and family therapist, so he brings a really rich uh, a theological as well as a um, perspective that is informed by his work as a therapist. 
we have the urban farm. If you guys haven't checked out our urban farm, right back here, um, once you leave the sanctuary in our foyer, there's a patio that has our urban farm. Uh, big shout out to all the urban farmers in the building. It looks like the little buds are starting to sprout. If you guys haven't seen them, please uh, see Anna Chow. Um, I don't see um, our brother Kevin Kota today, but there are a few folks that have been doing it for a while and they're, what are we growing right now? And probably in a, in a few weeks we'll be seeing, we'll be harvesting, which means we'll just have some fresh greens for folks to take home and enjoy in a salad or whatever it is that, uh, wherever you, yeah, bok choy is pretty good with meat. I like that with like a, a steak, right? It's a good, good, good thing, right? Probably not very healthy. Um, Mahalo Thanksgiving. Okay, this is the one that I want to spend at least two minutes on, okay? We are doing, as you have noticed, we are adding more events to the calendar. The goal is to help people reconnect. We've all been coming out of this very long hiatus via Zoom. So we're having little things. The skate night, last week we had a concert here. We had over 100 people in the uh, sanctuary enjoying this wonderful youth orchestra. Things are coming along little by little. This next Sunday, following the service, we are having a luau. So we're inviting you to wear your Hawaiian attire. We're gonna have some food catered by Aloha Cafe, as well as inviting folks in the congregation that want to contribute uh, to the potluck, feel free to do so. There's a sign-up sheet in the, um, in the hallway. If you wanna bring some desserts, aside, some refreshments, feel free to do so. The um, Thanksgiving Mahalo Luau is going to be starting right after the 11 o'clock service. So about 12.30, 12.15, we'll be enjoying this wonderful Hawaiian-themed uh, luncheon. And we're also going to have performances. We're going to have some folks coming in and uh, doing some songs. It's going to be a wonderful time. We're going to be doing this with our Nichigo congregation. So you'll have some Japanese performances, some English performances, and just phenomenal Hawaiian food. If you guys have not had Hawaiian food, it's it's comfort food. It's soul food. It sticks to your bones. Uh, at this time, I want to invite our brother, Pastor Randy, to come up and give us a closing benediction. All right, brothers and sisters, close your eyes, bow your head, receive the benediction. God, we thank you so much for your provision. Uh, as we uh, engage in our daily activity, uh, let us be mindful, Lord God, of eternity. Uh, let us be mindful of the work that you are doing in and through us individually and collectively. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Randy. Thank you all for joining us today for our service. Please stand, if you're able, for our closing song, The Heart of Worship. When the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come longing just to bring something that's a worth that'll bless your heart so I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear. You're looking into my Oh, it's 
king of endless words No one could express How much you deserve Lord, and the one we can pour All I am is yours Every single Thank you very much. Yes, yes, go ahead. All right.